my name is London Kaur and I am an 8th grader here at Menlo School. And we're going to be speaking with Bonnie Simi today, but really quickly I just wanted to talk a little bit about why I started this organization, OBJECT. Um, as I went into middle school, I realized that the girls around me were changing and also the definition of cool was changing. Um, the girls became more into the boys and how they looked and the infamous keeping up with the Kardashians and since I don't like those things, I felt like a total loner, um, like just so sad and alone. And then a little time later, there was a STEM workshop at Menlo and I missed it because I didn't want to be even more uncool. And I realized after that, that without confidence, you really can't do anything. I mean, there could be a million and one STEM workshops, but if girls aren't confident, you just won't go. And that's why I started OBJECT, to make sure that girls are confident and we just don't really fall to peer pressure and stereotypes. Um, and Bonnie Simi, so she is an amazing woman. She is currently the president of JetBlue Ventures. Prior to working there, she was a three-time Olympian, commercial pilot, and TV commentator for NBC and CBS. Welcome everybody, and I'm really, really excited. And I, I first of all, a big shout out to Manat. Um, when she reached out to me, you know, I thought back when I was in eighth grade, and um, I had some of the very similar um, feelings and stuff, and, and I was really into doing different and exciting things. But I really didn't know how, and uh, so I like I like this organization you set up. But I do want to give a big shout out in that the entire setup of today and reaching out to me and following up and all that kind of stuff was only with Manat. This was not with parents or anything else. So I thought that was really cool. So Manat got a reference to a friend of mine, and then I I uh, so I went on the website I'm like oh. Manat's going to be great. Cool. And I have to say, you're more organized than some of the others. I'm actually going to a very large organization in about an hour and a half to speak. And you were more organized than my speaking engagement at 1230 today. Wow. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> some of you might know that large <laughs> So you have, you have a future and certainly in organizing large events. I have to say that. Um, so at any rate, one of the things that um, I wanted to share, and part of this is um, when I go back to the, a story that when I um, uh, was growing up and what changed my life, and this is something that I like to share. And part of this, a lot of people uh, talk about dreams coming true, uh, which is great. Dreams do come true. The message I have, and the thing that if I can give you one thing to think about today, is that you have to have have to have a dream for dreams to come true. So today we're gonna, I'm going to share a little bit about what my dreams were, which all came true, uh, and then we'll, we have a little bit of an exercise on on you and some dreams that you might have. And I'm also going to share a little bit about the, the, for those of you really into the science side. I am still a pilot, and I have an activity on how airplanes fly. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do two activities today. So when I grew up, I grew up in a tiny mountain town um, up in, the, in Southern California. Uh, that was my school. So um, that was my school uh, up through uh, sixth grade. And then I got bused down this mountain, all the way down the mountain, um, to a school, a middle school, uh, that had a thousand kids. So I was in a school from kindergarten through sixth grade. There um, were 30 kids in the entire school. And then I went to middle school with a thousand kids. So you can imagine the culture shock. And it was in Southern California, um, which is where the Kardashians are. So, <laughs> um, uh, so this is kind of this was my upbringing. And uh, uh, but one thing that did happen um, when I was in it was I was a freshman um, in high school. I was 14 years old, and there was an assembly that, that we had to go to. And I thought, oh, it's another assembly, another speaker. They're always boring. Um, but this speaker was different. Um, his name was John Goddard, and he came up uh, with, at the age of 14, a list of 100 things he wanted to accomplish in his life. This is way back when, and they were crazy things, like land on an aircraft carrier, milk a poisonous snake, circumnavigate the globe, go to the moon, uh, learn Spanish, all these different things. And then I thought that was really cool, and he said, climb, climb Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Baldy. Well, the, map, the town that I lived in was Mount Baldy, and that was the mountain I lived on. It's like, wow, this is really, really cool. So then he had, 
of course it was full, so they had an assignment, and we had to come up with, with um, a list of our goals. What do we want to do? What do we want to achieve in our life? What are some fun things that we wanted to do? And he said, imagine that you knew you would succeed, and there would be absolutely no obstacles. Money wasn't an object, um, location wasn't an object, anything. And we had to come up with a list of goals. Um, so I did. Um, and I have a short two-minute video um, from some years ago uh, when I was interviewed by Oprah about this list of five things that I came up with. When I was 14, I wrote this list. I don't actually have this list still. I wish I had saved it. So that's a, I'm giving you a little guidance as to why you're holding something in your hand right now. Um, but these were actually my goals um, that I wrote, and I'm going to walk through a little bit, again, giving a little context to the story, um, and then we have a little bit of an activity. So, as I mentioned in the, in the story, I, I really wanted to go to a really good college. It was in Berkeley. Um, both of my parents had gone to college, they actually had gone to Berkeley. Um, and I was a little bit of a rebellious child, so I didn't want to go to Berkeley. <laughs> I wanted to go. I, I wanted to go to Stanford. I actually wanted to go to a variety of different schools, but uh, I, my big dream was to go to Stanford. And it's really hard to get in. It's hard then. It's hard now. Um, and my mother said we couldn't afford it. And I said, which was true, we wouldn't be able to afford it. She had to go to state school because you can get a scholarship there. I said, Mom, just let me try. They'll waive the application fee. Let just let me try. And, and that's one of the first things is a lot of times people will tell you you can't do something. Um, but I will say if you listen to them, you, they will win. Because you have to, in order to win the lottery, you have to enter. To, in order to get into Stanford, you have to apply. In order to, to do whatever your dreams might be, you have to take that first step. So I did apply. And lo and behold, I got, got in. Um, which was really kind of interesting is at the exact same time I, I put a ton of effort, a ton of effort into the application um, and writing these essays. Um, and at that same time, I started thinking to myself, hey, you know, I had that list, because now this is, I was 17 or 18 years old, uh, and I written the list when I was 14. And I thought, well, hmm, there's Olympics too, and I was playing field hockey at the time, and field hockey is what got me into Stanford. And I thought, well, I can go to the Olympics in field hockey maybe. And so I was thinking about this, and then there was a, a magazine called Runner's World, and there was an article about being an Olympic torch fair, and you had to write an essay. Now, I was a typical kid, and like, want to repurpose my essays. <laughs> and since I put so much effort into my college essay, I, I kind of repurposed a little bit to apply to the Olympic torch fair. Um, and that, it was successful. It was a pretty good essay. Um, I was one of 50 people uh, to go to Lake Placid. So I am here, um, 18 years old, in this picture. Um, I was a freshman at that point at Stanford. So I started at Stanford my fresh, uh, in the fall <coughs> and I took winter quarter off so I could go to Lake Placid to be at the 1980 Olympics. And then while I was there, I saw this really, really crazy sport. Um, and it's called luge. And luge is where you lie on your back and go feet first downhill. And there were, unlike before where I had some people say you can't do something, there were a whole lot of people that said, there was another torchbearer who was a bobsledder, um, and he said, you could be really good at luge. And a lot of people said I could be really good at luge, and I said, well, I really want to do bobsled. And he said, women aren't allowed to bobsled. Women were actually banned internationally from the sport of bobsled. Uh, in 19, uh, uh, this was in 1980. And I said, well, if I can't do bobsled, then I will do luge. Uh, and so I took a couple rides on the sled, and I just absolutely fell in love with it. Um, and uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of a view of what this sport is because it does give you, I was scared at first because um, you're going down an ice chute, um, but we started at the, near the bottom of the track and we only went about the distance from like across this room twice. You could, anybody can go on a sled that distance. And how many, how many is, of you have been on a sled before? Just any kind of sled? Yeah, and you probably have done like twice this distance, so it didn't seem all that difficult. <laughs> all right, on your little piece of paper, if you're really, you can write down USA Luge, L U G E dot org. USA Luge dot org. So you can go there to that website. They have summer camps and I, that are just like a day. Um, and I used to do these camps, and we did it one up off of page off of uh, Sand Hill Road. 
Um, there's a little frontage road. And we teach people how to do luge on the road. It's all safe, don't worry parents. Um, and then kids who do that really, really well get invited to go to Lake Placid. And we've had uh, four, four national team athletes and three Olympians that started in the program right off of Sand Hill Road. So these things, my, my point is you have to start somewhere. You have to think about what is that first step. So after I was at the Olympics, remember my list? I said I want to be a TV reporter. Well, as it turns out, at the Olympics, they, they like to have somebody who's an athlete talk on the, about the sport. And so I was hired by ABC News. Uh, at the time, they were the Olympic uh, station. Now it's NBC and CBS. Um, and I uh, started filing some stories for KGO TV, which is still KGO TV here in San Francisco. And I did a bunch of them from the Olympics, and they liked it, so then they hired me. So that became my first job out of college. Um, and then, my second to last dream goal that I had written down at the age of 14 was that I wanted to be a pilot. Now, when I was 14, there weren't any female airline pilots. Um, but I wasn't really thinking of being a, a female airline pilot. I just wanted to be a pilot of little planes. I'm sure you guys have seen the little tiny planes. about flying. Um, but I decided, saved up some money and I decided I was going to go to the Palo Alto airport and I was going to take three lessons. And after those three lessons, I would decide. I fell in love with it. I remember getting in the cockpit and looking at it and saying, that's way too complicated. I will never, ever, ever, ever be able to figure this out. Um, but uh, I got so into it within a couple of months, I got my private pilot's license. And then over time, I got, I got more and more passionate about and less and less passionate about being a TV reporter. Yeah. Um, and I decided, and I realized that, you know, the airplane doesn't know if you're a boy or a girl, right? So it doesn't know if there's a female pilot or male pilot. And women were starting to get more into, into, into aviation, and I decided I want to be an airplane pilot. Um, and so I applied to United, because it's the only airline I knew, which was here in the Bay Area. I did get accepted to United. I was there for 13 years, uh, and then I decided to go work for a startup, like any of us here in the Valley do. Um, but it was a startup airline called JetBlue, and that is where I still am. So now this is airplanes that I fly, and this is what the cockpit looks Whoa. like. So remember when I first started going to fly? This looked way too complicated. There's absolutely no way I would be able to learn how to do it. Um, obviously, I learned how to do it, and now I fly this, and it looks really, really complicated, but I can do it. And um, so when I come back to my full circle, now I have my dreams. These were, or these were my goals. Um, I've accomplished four. Actually, I accomplished all four by the time I reached age 30. I had not yet done the log cabin. And I haven't done the log cabin. You've got to save something for retirement. <laughs> so the first um, uh, little activity, and then we'll do some questions. Um, the first little activity is that what you, you should, everybody should have a piece of paper and a pen. And you also have a piece of cardboard too. Mm -hmm. On the piece of paper, um, I would like you to write a list. You have about two minutes. Okay, so we're gonna come back to those in a little bit. That's just for you. Um, you can fold it in half, you don't have to share it with anybody. Um, we are, when we get to the second part of the activity, we're gonna pick one that you're gonna, we're gonna talk about, any one of them. Um, but we'll save that. So I wanted to open it up for some questions and then we'll come back to the second part. Sure. Um, so how do you stay motivated? Because it's like there's just all these cool things you want to do. How do you like keep yourself going? Um, well, I think um, for me, I'm just always very, very curious. Uh, and I have learned that if you put your mind to something, you absolutely can get it done. Um, and so for me, uh, I just want to keep doing cool stuff. Now, on that video that you saw from Oprah, you saw that little girl. She was, I mean, 18 months, uh, maybe, yeah, I think probably 18 months. Um, she's now 18 and in college. So um, part of that's my daughter. Uh, and um, part of the thing that, that keeps me motivated now, too, is I like to be a really good example for my daughter. So um, those are the kind of the two things that keeps me motivated. And 
do you like, because there's so many things you want to do, do you ever feel overwhelmed? Is, just, is it like really, do you feel pressured, like I have to achieve all oh, these good things? Good point, yeah. Um, you know, when I wrote my list, I really didn't think I would achieve them. It was, I don't know, I just wrote, just like now, I just wrote them down. And he just said, imagine, now mind you, I, I, had a, I was living with oh, my mom, um, so single mom, she was disabled, um, I, we didn't, she couldn't drive, um, so I, I was kind of the one that could drive, and was grocery shopping and all that. So what are the chances of me achieving any of those things? Uh, well, college I was pretty, that one I was pretty, pretty head, um, uh, dead set on. Uh, I, but it, one of those things is once I actually got into, achieve the first one, I realized, and, and it was something that a lot of people said I couldn't do, nobody else from my school got in. Uh, I thought, well, if you don't try, I won't get there. And I just have it in my back pocket. I mean, these things took 20 years to do, right? So it wasn't like I had to, I did it all at once. It's just I did one thing and then, okay, well, now what? So um, I didn't feel the pressure that I had to. Besides, nobody else knew I had the list. So. <laughs> um, what role did confidence play in your success? Um, well, confidence was everything. This is why I liked your, your, um, your, your setup that you've put together is um, I think society, even then and even now, because I see it through my daughter's eyes, is that people cast you in certain roles and they say that girls can do these things and boys can do these things or should or shouldn't and you know, girls are pink and boys are blue or whatever. Um, and you know, I, I learned very early on to not listen to that, to listen to my inner compass. And I think that um, that is, if I could pick one thing that made me successful, was that confidence. It is when you walk into a room, I, I look confident. And so people see the confidence in you, in how you speak, and how you sit, and how you talk, and how you project. Automatically, they project back that you must be a confident person. Even though inside I might be shivering and shaking and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's, it, 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 the confidence perpetuates confidence. And well, why did you choose to, like, why a log cabin? That's a good question. question. You know, why the log cabin? It is actually the one thing, like I said, I have it. And my husband, um, I keep saying, honey, we, you know, someday we're going to have that log cabin, you know? And he's like, honey, log cabins, they're not very practical. There's, um, <laughs> the energy efficiency isn't there. And, I don't know, someday just, I, it's almost like I just have to. I did build our house, but it's not like cabin. Um, so it kind of did this, but, um, well, I grew up in a mountain town. There were, um, the population of my, of my hometown um, was 250 people, and it was in an international forest, and I hiked a lot, and I saw a lot of cabins, and I just thought, if I, you know, I dreamed of having a house someday. So I dreamed of having a house, the house that I could reference, because most of the houses where I lived were log cabins. So. I really said, I probably really meant I want to have, own a house someday, but the way I expressed that was I want to go log cabin. I think, because this is a long time, this is, you know, when I wrote the list, I didn't really think that I'd be referring to the list for the rest of my life. That's pretty, like, intense. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I've always wanted to stay in, like, those log cabins, like the ones that they show in the movies, uh -huh. with, like, kind of like the fireplace. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's like, oh. Um, so, as a generation of tomorrow, how do you think we can influence the world around us? I think you can influence the world around you um, by being you, by actually following up on one of those goals there and actually pursuing it and projecting confidence. <coughs> and in 10 or 15 years, um, you might be in the same seat, right? And so you influence others. So if I uh, I would not be where I am now if it wasn't for that assembly with that guy when I was 14 years old. So if I can touch the lives of just two people, two girls, who then go on to, to achieve great things, that's greater than achieving just mine, right? And if those two could inspire two more each, then that's four. And if those four could inspire more, right? So then it's, you know, it just multiplies. Now, I would to touch more than two people, but you just never know. So that's how, I, and so it's, it's when you are successful, not if, please go on to inspire others. Does anyone have questions or? Yes. Did you overcome any stereotypes when you were um, um, in your first day of your goals? Yes, did I, so the question was did I ever overcome stereotypes? 
So yes, I will go back to the fact that I grew up in that tiny mountain town. Um, there were only two other girls my age, um, and we were all mountain girls. Uh, we didn't really watch TV or any of that kind of stuff. And the most practical clothes to wear were jeans and overalls. Um, so when I went to junior high school, and then I bust down from my little town down the hill, my first day of school, um, I wore what I usually wore, which was a t-shirt and overalls. This is Southern California land of the Kardashians. Um, so you can imagine the first impression that I made on my classmates was this, this is this hillbilly country bumpkin. And it was pretty hard to shake that. And finally I decided I'm just not going to. Um, it was too much money to buy all the dresses. I didn't, we didn't have a lot of money. I mean, my, we made our clothes. Um, so uh, the stereotype, um, I was sort of stereotyped as this person that didn't fit in. Um, in the end, I kind of rechanneled that energy into my studies and into sports. And because when you're on a sports team, you all are in the same uniform. And I fit in there. And so um, that was where my channel was. <coughs> that's how I was. Yes? Uh, how old were you when your parents got divorced? Um, I, I was four years old. Yeah, so it was pretty intense, yes. Why did you choose to become a pilot and not like a ship captain or like a class? Oh, good question. Why did I choose to become? Well, it was interesting, and this is where you just never know this, um, what chance encounters you'll have as a um, growing up that, that inspire you. So I didn't know anybody was a pilot at all. So this is my one ask for you that I did not do when I started my list. Remember I told you I don't actually have the original list that I wrote. I had to rewrite it. I would like you to, um, this weekend, to take your piece of cardboard home and write a list of at least five things on it. And save it. And just keep, it could be just for yourself if you want to. You could hide it in your sock drawer. Mm -hmm. Some, whatever. And then take it out again when you're 14 years old is anybody here already 14? Oh, okay, so when you're 16 years old, you <laughs> And then you can look at it again and you can rewrite it again if you want to. But I want you to write down something. When you write something down, and remember, nothing is too crazy. And if you want to share it with your parents, you can share it with your parents, but you don't have to. I did not show this list to my mom. Um, because remember she told me that I couldn't go to Stanford because we didn't have money. And so I, I saved it. And then of course when I went to the Olympics then I, then I told her about my list. And then she's very, very supportive. Um, so at any rate, that's the reason why I wanted to have the cardboard. So sometime this weekend, and you could do it later today or whatever, write down at least five things. Um, so the next part, before we I have, because I have the other part. Because some people may have come here to learn how airplanes fly. So we have the second part of our activity. There's an airplane. Airplanes are really heavy. So the airplane that I fly, um, when it has gas and everything else, is 100,000 pounds. 100,000 pounds is about all of the weight of all the people in this room times at least 10, 15, plus the furniture and everything else. It's a lot of weight. How do you think that the airplane stays in the air? Yes? Um, that it goes so fast that the wings kind of make like a pocket. No, the air makes a, um, like a kind of pocket around the wings, kind of like grasp onto it. Oh, that's a very, very, very good. That's close. Yes, yes, yes. Yes? The shape of the wings means there's less pressure on, on top of than on the bottom, so it goes up. Wow! Oh, you can come up here and teach this. So yes. Yes, so, I, they, so both of you are right. Both of you are right. And this is something a lot of people don't realize. People think that the reason that airplanes fly is because they have big engines on them. <coughs> yes, they have big engines on them. But the reason that the airplanes have big engines on them, because if you gotta get, there's the gravity, right? So we have to lift up, get up in the air and the gravity. The reason that the airplanes have engines, so air goes in, it goes in the engine, and stuff comes out the back, is because it's to get lift is to get the airplane to move through the air and the airplane will move through the air so that the air goes over the wings and see how the air is going over this wing i'm going to let that kind of operate here here is a cross section of a wing okay see this is what like the, the cross section of a wing now this is a wood one the ones that we fly like jet blue are not wood 
Um, but do you notice that the top of the wing is longer a distance than the bottom of the wing? So the air has to travel over the top of the wing. And air molecules, the, let's imagine we have our two little friends here. We have air molecules. So I have a string of air molecules. They have little smiley faces on them. <laughs> so this is a whole long string of air molecules, kind of like these air molecules here. So if an air molecule hits the front of the wing at the top and goes down here, versus going on the bottom, when they come to the other end, they have to match up at the same time. So two air molecules, they hit the wing, this guy here and this guy here. This guy over the top and this guy over the bottom, if they're gonna be buddies again at the end of the wing, what's, how fast are the ones at the top gonna to have to go faster or slower than the ones at the bottom? Once the top gonna have to go faster. Exactly. Now, it doesn't manufacture new air molecules. So what, if these guys have to go faster, what will happen to the air molecules? Will they be closer together or further apart? They're going faster. Further apart. What happens when the air molecules are further apart? There's more air space in between them. So if there's more air space between these air molecules, that means that there's less pressure. And so it's lower pressure on the top of the wing and higher pressure on the bottom. So there's these molecules are going to push up, and these molecules will like this. So that is how an airplane flies. So, um, uh, oops. Uh, uh, I need, here's my question. Yeah, that's, okay, so I have this little activity that I want to share with everybody. Um, Tarun, would you mind handing out all the airplanes? Sure. Everybody's going to get a little paper airplane. And we're going to do something different. Some of you may have flown, they're not really paper, it's a little balsam wood, a little airplane. Once you all have one, because we're going to build it together. Um, and maybe you've built these little airplanes before. Uh, but we're going to do something a little different than a normal airplane. Because we're going to actually demonstrate how this works. So once everybody gets their airplane, now you can take them out of the plastic. I cut open the thing, so it should be easy to get them out. So take them out. So once you have them all out, okay. You should have three pieces. They're kind of like this. You have three pieces. You have this piece, which is the wing. You have oops, this piece, which is the fuselage, or the, this part of the airplane, the main part of the airplane. And then you'll have a piece that looks kind of like this, all put together, right? What I want you to first do is take the piece that looks like this, and I want you to, to separate it. So a little, there should be a little dent there to break it, yep. Good. Good, okay. So now you should have four pieces. The first thing I want you to do is to take the wings, and it says Hiller Aviation Museum uh, on it, because that's where I got them. Um, and the front of the airplane is going to be this um, metal clip thing. So I want you to slide the wing in there. Um, so that what is, the, which, Chris, which is the top? So this is the front with the metal clip. The top of the airplane has a groove up here. Okay, so look where the groove. So I want you to slide the wings. So just watch what I have here. So I have, hold this in your right hand. You have the metal clip. You have this slot and the top of it is, there's a slot up there. Take the Hiller Aviation Museum and point it like this. So you can see what I'm doing here. Slide it, slide it in. Help your person next to you if they need help, okay? You got to center. Make sure every, hold you, once you're done, hold it up so I can see that everybody's got it. Help your neighbor if they need some help. Good, it looks like we got everybody. We need a little bit of help there. Very good, very good. It looks like everybody's got the wings going in the right way. Very good, very good. Okay, so now if I were to throw this right now, which I will, you'll see, it's not going to fly very well. It goes straight down. See that? Don't fly it yet. But it goes straight down. Um, and so we need to add something to it. We need to put the tail on it. 
So now you have your piece that looks like this, right? Every piece only looks like this. Um, this piece is going to go on the end, and it's going to be the round part going forward. Okay, so it goes on the end like that, sort of center it nicely. So it looks like that. Looks like everybody's got very good. Everybody's got their airplanes. Very good. Okay. Then the last piece that it needs is our little rudder piece, which is going to be this little piece here. You want the slanted part to go front, in the front. And it's going to go right on top like that. You just slide it in. Got it? If you broke, if it broke, do we have an extra one? If somebody's broke, um, okay, yeah. Okay. All right. Here, let's see. Okay. There. Okay. Oh, well, you can get another one. If somebody if you broke, you can get another one. The rudder and things. Oh, uh, we need oh, some rudder pieces. Who needs a rudder piece? Oh, um, you'll be able to use mine. Here, we'll trade. I have this piece. Uh, okay, the next row we have an extra rudder piece. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, what we'll do is you'll be able to use mine after this. Okay. All right. So, does everybody have an airplane? Or, and if you don't, we can. You'll end up sharing. Okay. So we have our airplanes. Now, if I we all threw it in, inside the room, we'd have too many airplanes everywhere. Yeah. I would like you to write, take the pen that you have and write your name on the airplane. The last thing is to, can you take the little post-it notes and get everybody two post-it notes? Okay. You've got your name on the airplane. Good. Because what we're going to do is we're going to go downstairs. There's stairs, right? We can all just go downstairs. Don't we? The elevator. Okay. We're going to go down the stairs, and we're going to practice a little bit down at the park time. But let me explain what we're going to practice. All right. Remember that I said that airplanes, the um, the wings, you need to make a longer distance. So I'm giving you two post-it notes. You'll be able to practice this at home. So we're only going to give a little bit, but I want you to go practice this at home. You're going to take post-it note, and you're going to put it on one, uh, um, on both of the wings, like this. So it looks like that. Um, and you're just going to have it flat and straight for now, so that it's yep, just like that, exactly. And make the post-it notes so they're pretty, pretty straight so they're not really curved at all. And then what you're gonna do when we go downstairs is we're gonna fly it just like this. Then we're gonna see what happens. You're gonna kink one up and one down, like that. The next time you fly it, you're gonna do this. So I'll show you with one, only one. I don't fly it in here, I'll just do one. And you know, they're not perfectly balanced, so I may not go straight, but we'll just see. That's not too bad. Yeah, but it, it was not too bad, it went to the right. Okay, so what I'm going to do, and you guys are going to have to play with this at home because you're going to have to experiment, that's what all experiments are. I'm going to try to make the airplane turn left, okay? I'm going to try to make the airplane turn left. So in order to make the airplane turn left, I need it, need it to go this way, right? So I need to create more lift on this way than on this way. So I'm going to make this one go like this. So this is going to make more lift because there's going to be more distance for the airplane. And this one's going to go up. So now this one is going to have less lift. And this one's going to have more lift. Let's see if it works. OK. Make sure. Well, you know what I did? He's in a little bit of spiral. But anyways, you play with these things. You can see how moving the wings and you can experiment. Moving these little post-it notes will help you change the, the path of the airplane. So let's take the airplanes down and we're going to go practice and play.